So uh, welcome to tonight's plenary paper. Before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to note that tonight's paper has been designated the Graham Stanton Memorial Lecture for 2020. Graham Stanton held chairs in New Testament studies at King's College London and in Cambridge, and he was the co-founder of the British New Testament Society, along with his friend, Professor J.D.G. Dunn. Graham passed away in 2009. Jimmy, on the 26th of June this year. They're both sadly missed, and as a society, we are enormously in their debt. On a personal note, I owe my career to the two of them. Graham, for appointing me to my first post at King's College London. Seems to be some remarkable feedback. Graham, for appointing me to my first post at King's College London. And Jimmy is the anonymous reader who had recommended my doctoral thesis to Graham for publication in the SNTS monograph series. But tonight's speaker is Professor Hugh Houghton, Professor of New Testament Textual Critical Scholarship at the University of Birmingham and Director of the Institute for Textual Scholarship and Electronic Editing. One of the most positive developments in New Testament scholarship over the past 30 years has been the growing recognition that the New Testament can't be adequately studied apart from the early reception of its individual books, the process, the very process that brings the New Testament collection into being. This focus on reception has coincided with developments in textual criticism that have made it much more accessible and in my opinion, much more interesting than it ever was before. In particular, the use of new technology to digitize the manuscript record and to enable us to focus not only on the wording of the texts, but also on the physical artifacts that are the bearers of the texts. Hugh Houghton has been absolutely at the forefront of these developments, continuing the impressive Birmingham tradition, also represented by his predecessor, Professor David Parker, and earlier by Professor Neville Birdsell. Hugh's primary scholarly field is the Latin Bible, of course. Uh, he also works extensively with uh, a Greek material, but his, perhaps his primary scholarly field is the Latin Bible. In 2016, he published a book entitled Latin New Testament, The Guide to Its Early History, Texts and Manuscripts with uh, Oxford University Press. And this will be followed next year by an Oxford handbook to the Latin Bible that he has edited. I'll mention just two other highlights from his long list of individual and collaborative publications, many of them available online from his superb personal website. In 2017, he produced a translation and introduction uh, to a recently discovered fourth century commentary on the Gospels by Fortunatianus of Aquileia. And in April of this year, a co-authored article in the Journal of Theological Studies announced the discovery of the manuscript formerly known as P. Cairo 1075, containing, among other things, the so-called Achmim fragment of the Gospel of Peter and part of one Enoch in Greek. Following its initial publication in the 1890s, this exceptionally important manuscript seemed to have disappeared from view. But Hugh and his co-author found that it had been moved to the Bibliotheca Alexandrina in Alexandria, and they were able to see and study it there. This evening's session is being recorded and will shortly be available online. And I would now like to invite Professor Houghton to present his paper entitled Codex Zacynthius, New Light on the Oldest New Testament Catena Manuscript. Thank you very much, Francis. Let me tie and get the PowerPoint to display as it should. Good, I hope you can all see the PowerPoint now coming through your screens. I'd like to thank the Testament Society Committee for their kind invitation to deliver this lecture and also our Durham hosts for continuing to hold this conference despite the pandemic. 
Thanks too to all of you who are still at your screens after a full day of papers. Given that I should be talking about the use of digital technology to recover and publish a New Testament manuscript, perhaps it is appropriate that my paper is being given online. As this is the Graham Stanton Memorial Lecture for 2020, I will note that I finished my studies at one of the Cambridge colleges founded by Lady Margaret Beaufort the summer before he returned as Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity. Yet as the subject of this presentation is a manuscript held in Cambridge University Library, I hope a useful way in which to honor the memory of Graham Stan in the year that he would have turned 80. Codex Achintheus is one of a select group of New Testament manuscripts normally known by its Latin name, like the more famous Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Alexandrinus. It takes its name from the place where it first became known to modern scholarship, which in this case is the Ionian island of Zakynthos, also known as Zante, just off the west coast of Greece. The governor of the island, Prince Commuto, presented the manuscript to General Colin Macaulay in the year 1820, exactly 200 years ago this year, according to the inscription on the back of the front cover. Macaulay, who later served as a member of parliament and was particularly committed to the abolition of slavery, was also a supporter of the British and Foreign Bible Society, to whom he donated the manuscript the following year. History does not relate whether this delay in his return from Dante involved a period of self-isolation comparable to certain travellers this week. In 1984, Codex Achintheus and other manuscripts belonging to the Bible Society were transferred to Cambridge University Library. But in 2013, this manuscript was put up for sale in order to raise funds for a visitor centre in North Wales. A campaign was launched to raise over £1 million to keep Codex Achintheus in Cambridge. And donations from individuals and organisations enabled its purchase by the University Library six years ago. The acquisition of the manuscript provided the impetus to undertake new research on its history and text. My colleagues and I at ITSI, the Institute for Textual Scholarship and Electronic Editing at the University of Birmingham, were delighted to collaborate with Cambridge University Library on a 24-month project funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council. The pandemic delayed the launch planned for earlier this year, so this lecture is now one of the first public announcements of the electronic edition of Philexicynthia now available online. I shall demonstrate this interface during the course of the presentation, but before that I'll start by providing some background on this manuscript and the state of the search when the project began back in February 2018. What is so important about Codex Achintheus? To begin with, it is not one manuscript, but two. Codex Achintheus is a palimpsest whose parchment pages come from an earlier document which was washed clean and rebound in order to be reused for the writing of another text. Both these manuscripts, in fact, are witnesses to the New Testament. The overtext is a gospel lectionary containing biblical passages in the order in which they were read out during Christian over the course of the year. This is copied in a standard minuscule script, which has been assigned to the 13th century. Yet if the pages are rotated through 90 degrees, some of the undertext can still be made out with the naked eye. This is not lowercase minuscule script, but the capital letters of majuscule script which was the standard form of Greek writing until the 9th and 10th centuries. What's more, the original page has an unusual layout. In the centre, in larger capitals, there are the few lines of biblical text from the Gospel according to Luke. Around the outside of this, on all three sides, is a commentary written in smaller letters. 
This consists of scolia, exegetical extracts from early Christian writers compiled by an editor to produce a running exposition of the scriptural text. This type of all-in-one commentary, with its chains of extracts, is known as a catena, the Latin for chain. It was particularly popular in the Byzantine church between the 9th and the 13th centuries, from which we have over 500 New Testament catena manuscripts. The format with commentary arranged around the outside of the biblical text, like some modern study Bibles, is known as a frame catena or Raman catena, if you prefer that technical term. This is more common among the older surviving copies. Later on, there's a higher proportion with an alternating catena format, in which lines of biblical text are followed by paragraphs of exegesis, as in a standard commentary. Despite the number, these manuscripts have daily been treated as a distinct set of witnesses to the text of the New Testament. And we currently have another project at ITSI examining this tradition more broadly, the European Research Council Catena project, which has all contributed to this presentation. Codex Acinthius, however, stands apart. It is the only surviving Catena manuscript in which both the biblical text and the extracts are written in majuscule script, which suggests that it is several hundred years older than the other witnesses to this type of commentary. Accordingly, it may provide several clues about the development of the tradition and its early text. It is also worth saying at this point that in addition to the importance of Catenae for the biblical text, they are of unparalleled value for the extracts they preserve from early Christian authors. A considerable number of the writings from which these passages were taken are no longer extant. So the Catenae are the only source for these examples of biblical interpretation from the third to the fifth centuries. We will see this later on when we come to look at the contents of, of Codex Secintius. First, however, there is the challenge of reading the original manuscript the undertext which was washed off when the pages were palimpsested. As the gospel text is in larger letters and its textual history is well documented, this is the obvious place to start. In 1858, a few decades after the manuscript was presented to the Bible Society, the textual critic Samuel Pledo Tegelis was given permission to study Codex Acinthius at his home in Plymouth. He produced an edition consisting of just the extracts from Luke, which was published in 1861 using a typeface which had been created for the printed edition of Codex Alexandrinus, but the magical script matches that of Codex Acinthius. Tegelis assigned Codex Acinthius the siglum of a capital Greek psi, and his edition provided the basis for citing this manuscript in subsequent editions of the New Testament. Both in Tischendorf's Editio Octava Maya of 1869 and Westcott and Hort's Greek New Testament of 1881, as well as the current Nestle Allant Hand edition, Codex Acinthius frequently appears as one of a set of few scripts in form believed to be the earliest text of Luke. For example, as you see here in Luke 743 and 850, it is found alongside Codex Vaticanus, that B, and one other majuscule, L, while at the bottom in Luke 10.27, they are joined by Papyrus 75, Codex Sinaiticus, and various other witnesses. In fact, in the year that Westcott and Hort's edition was published, Nicholas Pocock compared Codex Acinthius favourably to these two famous fourth century codices, calling it more correct than the Sinaitic and Vatican manuscripts, which have many more mistakes than the Codex Acinthius. On the other hand, Pocock also inconsistencies in Tegelis' edition. Apart from a single page of the manuscript which Tegelis reproduced in facsimile, and which I've shown you already, the commentary had to wait almost a century before a sustained attempt was made to read it. This was undertaken in 1950 
by J. Harold Greenlee from Asbury Theological Seminary as a contribution to work on the Gospel of Luke by the IGNTP, the International Greek New Testament Project. G.D. Kilpatrick, Greenlee's host at the University of Oxford under the Fulbright scheme, had arranged for Codex Echinthius to be brought up to the Bodleian Library from London, hence the Bodleian Reader's Declaration you see here. Greenlee describes in a letter how he worked with Codex Xi sitting on a wide window ledge of the Bodleian Library and a magnifying glass over the text and a mirror to focus the sunlight into the glass. Despite this unconventional setup, Greenlee fortunately seems to have kept the Bodleian reader's promise not to kindle therein any fire or flame. His six months of painstaking labour resulted in three brief articles published a few years later and 174 pages of a transcription of the Catena, which disappointingly at the time it was deemed impractical to publish. Nevertheless, this work was not lost. Its copies were kept by Kilpatrick and the American Committee of the IGNTP. The latter copy made its way to Birmingham in the late 1990s, when Neville Birdsell began a correspondence with Greenlee, who, as we saw in that letter on the previous slide, gave him permission to make full use of this material. This would prove a valuable starting point for the Codex Achintheus project 20 years later and we also contributed to a joint 2004 article by David Parker and Neville Birdsall, in which they suggested that Codex Achintheus had originally been copied around the year 700. Furthermore, in April 2019, another part of Greenlee's planned edition came to light when Keith Elliott found among Kilpatrick's papers a 40-page typescript introduction to the Catena of Codex Achintheus clearly by Greenlee himself. This has now belatedly been published as an appendix in the volume of studies produced by our project to acknowledge Greenlee's contribution to scholarship on this manuscript. Fortunately, neither Tregelis nor Greenlee resorted to the expedient common in the late 19th century of treating the pages of the palimpsest with a chemical reagent. Although this may initially have rendered the undertext more legible, in the long term, it makes a manuscript harder to read, as you can see in this recent image of Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. Such a restraint meant that the Codex Achintheus project was able to adopt a novel, non-invasive approach to reading the palimpsest. After acquiring the manuscript, Cambridge University Library had made some initial experiments with spectral imaging, using different wavelengths of light to recover ink, which is illegible to the, which is illegible to the naked eye. Results were promising, and the award of AHRC funding meant that this procedure could be applied to the whole manuscript. The imaging was carried out in Cambridge in the summer of 2018 by members of the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library in collaboration with the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg. Fresh from their work on the Sinai Palimpsest project, recovering valuable biblical and non-biblical text, including a previously unknown third witness to the old Syriac Gospels, these are two of the most experienced teams in this field, and we were delighted that they were able to participate in this project and that they have allowed us to make their contributions freely available. The first stage of the process was to take no fewer than 51 high resolution photographs of each page using different wavelengths of light from infrared to ultraviolet as well as x-ray. This short video clip shows the imaging in process working through part of the predetermined sequence of bands of light some perceptible to humans and others not. The whole series took seven minutes for each page. And you might be surprised to learn that each of these individual photographs is a monochrome image recording the response at that particular wavelength. Creating a multispectral image 
involves the selection of the photographs which most clearly display the desired features, using some to cancel out unnecessary noise or distractions and enhancing others or combinations of others by assigning them artificial colours. This is a complex process in which the imaging scientists Keith Knox and Roger Easton worked on site with textual scholars in order to achieve the best results possible. A video of this process has been posted on YouTube by Cambridge University Library. You see there's the link below on this slide, but also a link in the further section at the bottom of the handout if you want to click on that and watch it at some other time. After the initial round of processing, we had two complete sets of images, in addition to those under normal light, combining the whole visible spectrum, as you see here. The first was a set of composite pseudo-colour images, in which the undertext is coloured red. While these are an improvement on what can be seen with the naked eye, they're still relatively hard to work with, not least because of the dominance of the black letters of the overtext. The second set of images were grayscale images known as Sharpies. On these, most of the overtext was erased, but the undertext retained, as were the little crosses in red ink in the overtext that you can see punctuating the text in unexpected places. Although this gives a sense of the original page as a whole, it presents the opposite challenge by fragmenting the letters of the undertext. Yet towards the end of the process, Roger and Keith noticed an anomaly on one of the images. Further investigation of this unexpected aspect led them to come up with a third set of images known to the project as tipples with a different balance of constituents. These, as you can see, presented the undertext in by far the most legible way. It's coloured in the dark purple and the overtext is not entirely removed but coloured in a light blue or turquoise, which makes it easier for the brain to join together different parts of the same letter, which is obscured by the later writing. The quality of these images is such that the project relied on them exclusively for the transcription of the undertext, and they are the only multispectral images presented in the digital edition. Nevertheless, we have made all of the 51 original images of each page available for reuse on the University of Birmingham's Institutional Research Archive. And again, there's a link to those on the handout. Our hope is that this raw data can be used in the development of new techniques or processing methods, which might improve multispectral imaging or lead to further insights about this particular manuscript. The principal output of the Codex Acinthius project is an online edition of the whole manuscript, presenting full transcriptions of both the undertext and the overtext alongside high resolution images. And I shall try briefly to describe the process of creating this edition at the same time as demonstrating the final result. All in all, 10 people at ITSI contributed to the project, led by David Parker, the principal investigator and myself. Some of us had worked a decade earlier on the Digital Codex Sinaiticus, which provided a model for this edition, but our team also included two current postgraduate students, two early career postdoctoral researchers, and even a pupil from a local school on work experience. So this edition is a collaborative endeavour, which I present this evening on behalf of this team of contributors as well as our colleagues at Cambridge University Library. The transcription of the lectionary overtext posed problems of scale. The manuscript consists of 176 folios, densely written on both sides, including some heavily abbreviated lists. First comes the scenarion with gospel readings for almost every day of the year, arranged according to the liturgical season. And this is followed by the menologion, with details of the passages appointed to be led for each saint's day, sometimes with up to five options for the same day. A base text was created by excerpting each passage from a standard edition of the Greek New Testament. 
This was then compared with the manuscript and adjusted to provide an exact match with what Codex Echinthius had on each page. Liturgical indications in rubrics and any marginal material was added. All abbreviations and corrections were recorded and the format of each page was reproduced. The text was encoded in using the online transcription editor created by the Workspace for Collaborative Editing before being converted page by page to HTML for display in the electronic edition. The transcription can be seen alongside the images by selecting it in the View More Options menu if you click on the link to get through to the Codex Echinthius edition in the Cambridge Digital Library. There is a link to the edition on the handout, but um, this evening I'm going to play it safe and show you on some screenshots. You see, comparing the transcription with the page here, that the overall layout matches the images with the lectionary titles at the top and halfway down rubricated. Although if you're not sure what they are, moving your mouse pointer over them brings up an explanatory box. If you put your pointer on the section symbol at the beginning of each lection, that shows its position in the calendar. So S3W7D1 is part three of the Synaxarion, week seven, day one, the lection for which is two passages from Luke chapter eight. We've added verse numbers for ease of navigation, and those give the full biblical reference when users hover over them. And abbreviations are also expanded. So this rather abbreviated um, title at the top um, will show you in its box that it actually indicates the sixth Sunday before the Gospel of the Rich Man. On a separate web page, we provide the complete contents of the lection lee, and that has a hyperlink to the page of the edition in which each passage appears. Again, there's a link to that on your handout. So these digital tools make it easier than ever before to navigate the complex lection lead tradition. Another page provides a concordance between the overtext and the undertext. And this enables users to identify the multi-spectral images, which correspond to the photographs of the lection lead taken in normal light. In order to create a book which was half the size of the original, the pages of the Catena manuscript were folded in two when they were used and therefore appear in different places within each choir, as the sequence of this list shows. To reconstruct the original pages, the images of the two constituent halves had to be combined and notated as required. We chose to leave space between these two images to allow for text which remained illegible in the gutter of the lection, although in comparatively little text is obscured in this way. The shape of the original book would therefore have been more square than these images suggest, measuring approximately 36 centimetres in height and 29 centimetres in width. The two parts of the catena were transcribed separately. While the page images were being prepared, the transcribers began by making electronic files of the texts of Tregellis and Greenlee. They then compared these with the multispectral images and adjusted them as required, adding all of the formatting so as to be able to reproduce the layout. Occasionally, there was text visible to Tregellis or Greenlee, which could not be made out on the multispectral images. So unless this was an obvious error, we included this with a special tag in the edition to indicate its source. And if your mouse pointer passes over that, it will tell you that this text is supplied from Greenlee or Tregellis. You may also notice on this page that although the transcription was made using standard lowercase Unicode characters, we've decided to display the undertext in a majuscule font, which resembles that of Codex Sicinthius, to assist users in, when they compare the images with the transcription. As in the case of the lectionary, modern verse numbers are supplied to aid navigation of the gospel text in the middle panel of each. And all of the other numeral script are transcribed and identified. So in the catena, we also give the corresponding section number Pi is container extract number 80. 
These mouse over boxes are also used to explain features such as illegible text, lacunae and corrections, so that as the pointer passes over the page, the hints are given to help identify the different aspects of the translation. At the beginning of each extract in the container, there's an asterisk and hovering over that provides our identification of the source of the passage. We built on Greenlee's identifications by using the digital corpus of the TLG, the, Thes the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae, and other printed editions to tack down, wherever possible, the actual reference for each extract. And this mouse over box includes a link through the CPG number, the Clavis Patrum Graecorum, to the new open access Clavis Clavium produced by Brefols. This is a database which provides full bibliographical details for almost all individual patristic writings, which can be updated and enhanced by users. There's a link to that database as well on the handout. It is a shame that there's no straightforward way at present of linking to directly to the TLG to see the passage in its original context. But if that is introduced, it could be added to this Clavis Clavium database as well. Again, also noted on the handout, another web page provides the full contents of the Catena with hyperlinks to the relevant page in the digital edition, as well as other information about the extracts. And even though our goal was to make a comprehensive edition for use by those wanting to examine the manuscript in its original language, the project didn't stop there. In order to make this publicly funded research accessible to as wide an audience as possible, we also undertook to make a complete English translation of the Catena. As the majority of these extracts have been translated into English, we worked directly on the Greek transcription files, turning them into a fairly literal rendering, word for word, while maintaining the format which had already been added to each page. This initial draft was subsequently improved and refined although I should warn you that it has no claim to literary merit. Within the online edition, the translation shares many of the mouse over features with the Greek transcription, such as the section numbers, the biblical references, and the source identifications. One downside of the current Cambridge Digital Library interface is that it's not possible to display the transcription and translation side by side in the same window. But there is, of course, an easy workaround for that, which is to open two windows on your browser. As a supplement, though, to the original project, we've produced a printed edition which has the text and translation on facing pages. And this is also available online now in open access. Further details are given on the handout, and I'll talk about it on the last slide, too. Over the last two decades of making electronic editions at ITSI, we've come to realize that interfaces and their functionality change far more rapidly than the underlying data. So our goal is to produce data which will stand the test of time by being encoded in according to particular standards as different interfaces are developed and come and go in order to display this and use it in different ways. So like the images, all of our transcription files have also been deposited in the University of Birmingham Institutional Research Archive in an XML standard um, meeting the text encoding initiative um, guidelines. And our hope is that that will enable the data to be easily adjusted for different platforms or redeployed or developed in the future without being tied to its current presentation. More broadly, this practice has been adopted by all of the partners which are currently collaborating on the Editio Critica Maior of the Greek New Testament, currently in preparation. And that means that a collection is gradually being assembled of full text electronic transcriptions of Greek New Testament manuscripts, which can provide the building blocks for future editions and enable new approaches to studying the textual history of the New Testament. At present though, the Codex Echinthius edition is now fully functional in the Cambridge Digital Library. So I encourage you to visit it and to spread the word after this lecture. 
So you may be asking, what have we learned about the undertext of Codex Achintheus now that it's possible to read it in full for the first time in at least 800 years? Well, first, we should note that the Palimpsest manuscript is only partially preserved. 86 full pages and three half pages of the Catena survive, extending from the beginning of Luke's Gospel to the middle of chapter 11. Even this is not always continuous, presumably because certain pages were not in sufficiently good condition to be reused for the lectionary. There are some of the pages where the ink of the Catena has eaten through the page, leaving holes which the copyist of the lectionary has had to work round in order to light the These 18 pages preserve about two thirds of the text, and that suggests that the entire Gospel of Luke would have occupied approximately 240 folios. It's not impossible that the original manuscript may have contained another gospel or been part of a set, but it seems unlikely. One of the considerations against this is a short preface, which precedes the Catena. Although this preface, and this is all there is of it, does not refer specifically to Luke, it is particularly suited to the Codex, to the Catena in Codex Achintheus. First, the compiler states that a deliberate choice was made to include extracts not just from many works of holy and orthodox fathers, but also from exegetes who were discredited and met the fate of heretics. The presence of passages in this catena from writers such as Apollinaris of Laodicea and Severus of Antioch, possibly even Origen himself, exemplifies this polyphonic approach which characterizes catena. Second, the compiler explains towards the end that the biblical text has been divided into numbered sections, which are used to structure the catena. This can be illustrated by a typical page of the manuscript. On folio 10 verso, the first section is mu beta, 42. The yellow circles show this numeral written in the biblical text at the beginning of the modern Luke chapter 1 verse 40, and also to the left of the first scolium. In the top margin, the heading Eusebiu identifies the source of the first extract as Eusebius of Caesarea. In fact, this is inaccurate because this passage comes from one of Origen's homilies on Luke, but that need not detain us here. The next section is number 43, Mu Gamma, which is in the pink circles. This numeral is found at the exact point in the gospel text where the section begins, but also in the left margin as a reminder. There are two critical extracts for this section. The first immediately following the passage from Eusebius and the second at the bottom of the page is also indicated by the numeral in the left margin and here the heading Origenus, so attributing it correctly this time to Origen. There are a total of 327 Catena sections between Luke 1.1 1, 1 and 11.30. So that gives an average of around two sections for every three modern verses, although their length varies considerably. Most sections have only one or two extracts, but a few have up to five. Two other features of the section numbering are worth mentioning. The first two sections are devoted to the title of the gospel, one for gospel and one for according to Luke. Section three begins at the first verse. In addition, the section numbers start afresh every time the number 100 is reached, so they only work in the immediate context of the catena. They cannot be used as an independent reference system for the whole gospel. There are many other catena manuscripts in which the scolia are connected to the biblical text by a series of symbols, even though some of those manuscripts this preface found in Codex Achaeus, explicitly describing a numbering system. Later Catena manuscripts often abbreviate the biblical text, but a different policy is pursued in Codex Achintheus, the opposite in fact. On two of the pages which survive, one of which you see here, there are no scolia or Catena action numbers, but the gospel text has still been written out in full. The line you see in the top margin is the chapter title for chapter 10. Elsewhere, 
If the commentary is so extensive that it extends over more than one page, the biblical text is repeated. That happens 17 times on the surviving leaves, and two verses are repeated three times, one of which is Luke 9.1. Now the lack of the scolia in Tegelis edition on the right misled no less a figure than Eberhard Nessler to propose that this is an instance of symbolic copying, for he says, this cannot be a mistake. As Luke 9.1 tells of the granting of spiritual powers to the apostles, the triple repetition of this verse perhaps mirrors a threefold invocation used in exorcism. Well, as is often the case in New Testament textual scholarship, the true explanation is far more mundane. The commentary on this verse is so extensive that it occupies three pages. After the preface, the next three pages of the manuscript present another unusual feature. This is the earliest example known of a system called the Capitula Parallela. On the left are the numbers and titles for the standard 83 Greek chapters or fire for the God, which are first attested in the fifth century. But on the right hand side of the page, there are columns of numbers which identify the corresponding chapter where one exists in John, Matthew and Mark. The Kephaliah are not as well suited to this sort of cross-referencing as the Eusebian apparatus, but according to the Palatex Bib project at the University of Munich, tables of Capitula Parallela are found in a couple of hundred Byzantine manuscripts from the late 10th century onwards. So as with its catena, Codex Echinthius appears to precede the rest of the tradition by at least two centuries. In addition to the Kephaliah and the Catena sections, there's a third series of divisions marked in the margins. These are preceded by a cross with serifs to distinguish them from the other series of numbers. But what's remarkable about these divisions is that they are only attested by one other witness, the fourth century Codex Vaticanus, one of the most important New Testament manuscripts. The presence of these so-called Vatican paragraphs alongside the other systems contributes to the impression that Codex Echinthius is a scholarly production in which particular care has been taken over the presentation and the organization of the text. The consistent orthography, the scarcity of abbreviations, the provision of alternative readings, and the quality of copying with just a handful of collections also support this conclusion. Nevertheless, there are several errors which make it clear that Codex Echinthius is not the archetype of this catena, but a copy of an even older manuscript. And one of these is a unique edition in the Gospel at the beginning of Luke 7.31, which reads, he was no longer speaking to them, but to the disciples. Now you see in the yellow box, this is copied in to the body of the Gospel text. But the typescript um, that I've shown is an extract from the IGNTP edition of Luke, where you can see that all other witnesses to the Gospel of Luke have nothing in this place. This aside, referring to whom Jesus is speaking, is similar to observations by John Chrysostom elsewhere. And that suggests that part of the catena has here been erroneously incorporated into the text of the Gospel at some stage in the copying process. Research by the Catena Project has shown that Codex Echinthius stands apart from the rest of the tradition. The examination of almost 180 Catena manuscripts on Luke has identified just one other witness to this particular compilation, a four-page fragment copied in the 12th century. In addition to that, there seems to be a later reworking of this Catena in a manuscript copied in the year 1164, which is illustrated here. Um, incidentally, this is one of those manuscripts which um, has symbols connecting the text and commentary. So in the far right margin, you might make out there's a half moon symbol um, there showing the beginning of that um, container scolium. And then there's a half moon above Tis in the gospel text as well. So symbols rather than numbers in this one. And a new number of the um, scolia, from which we find in Codex Kinthius, are not present, but a significant 
proportion of others are showing the genetic relation of them. Both of these later versions of the Katena, however, have the text of the Gospels substituted with a later form. There are also some overlaps between Codex Echinthius and the Scolia in the mainstream Catena types of these 180 Catena manuscripts on Luke, especially an extensive Catena on Luke compiled by Nicetus of Heraclea at the beginning of the 12th century. But so far, it's not been possible to determine any genetic relationship between these. As it is, Codex Echinthius draws on a relatively restricted range of sources, citing just 10 authors. A little under half of the 343 surviving extracts come from Cyril of Alexandria's commentary on Luke, which is well attested in other Cataenae as well. That's followed by Origen, whose 67 scolia contribute one-fifth of the total. The only other writers who appear more than 10 times are Titus of Bostra and Severus of Antioch. Figures such as John Chrysostom, who features heavily in other Cataenae traditions, are barely cited. There's nothing here from Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus, or Gregory of Nyssa. But even so, the other columns in this table illustrate the value of Codex Echinthius and the other Catenae in transmitting access and in transmitting extracts from works which have not otherwise come down to us. Only 43 of the 343 scolia have also been located in the direct manuscript tradition of an author's writings. But other Catenae offer parallels for 286 of the scolia in Codex Echinthius, although it must be said, not necessarily with the same form of text. While 14 of the extracts do not appear previously to have been published. It's also worth mentioning that in addition to the 10 authors there, all of whom are named in Codex Echinthius, the provenance of around one in eight scolia in his manuscript is described in the heading as ex anepigraphu, from an unattributed source. This appears to be an earlier exegetical collection in which the authors were not named. Though we have been able to track down the source of all but nine of these, and the five authors whom we have identified are five of the ten authors existing in the Catena already. One author who particularly stands out in this catena is Severus of Antioch. The condemnation of Severus by Justinian in the year 536 included the banning of his books, with the result that very little of his work has survived in Greek. That makes it likely that he was one of the discredited exegetes mentioned in the preface. Even though, as you see at the bottom, he is also described Severus of Antioch before several extracts. Now, unusually, the scolia titles for Severus also give details of the work from which the passage is taken, such as the letter to Anastasia the deacon, or Sergius the chief physician, and the apology of Philalethes, or the treatise against the testament of Lampetia. The only parallels for these Severan extracts are in a rather sketchy edition published by Angelo May in 1838. And in many cases, the text in Codex Echinthius is significantly longer and may well provide the most substantial surviving evidence for some of Severus's works in their original language. Now, several of these extracts are characterized by a rather colorful vocabulary, and that could offer a key to identifying Severan material in other Catenae. For example, some of these passages occur in the palace manuscript, but without any identification of the author, perhaps because of doctrinal concerns. So if we can identify the match between Codex Echinthius and the later version of this Catena in the palace manuscript for the first 11 chapters, that would give us some hints, particularly in terms of the vocabulary and the length of the passage, of possible Severan extracts in the latter half of the Gospel according to Luke. That's work which remains to be done. It's not only in the undertext that the Codex Echinthius project has made new discoveries. There's a characteristic feature in the overtext of the lectionary that has enabled our colleague Georgi Papalov 
to identify the scribe of the lectionary and the location and period at which it was produced. Such details are sometimes given in a colophon at the end of Byzantine manuscripts, but there is no colophon to the lectionary of Codex Echinthius, although it's possible that the final pages of the lectionary have been lost. Instead, there are the series of notes in the bottom margin, as you see on the right hand page of this opening, often taking the format of 12 syllable verses. Such epigrams are more usually found at the conclusion of a work. It's much rarer to see them distributed throughout the text. But three other manuscripts share this feature, whose colophons state that they were copied by the monk Nelos on the island of Rhodes, one in the year 1170, that's the Vatican one on the right, and two in 1180. And in fact, you can see on the Vatican image there, um, there is one of these notes in the bottom margin that has the name Nylos visible in it. In 1181, the same Nylos added a note in another Greek New Testament lectionary, which is still in Rhodes. This copyist may be identified with the Nylos who became abbot of the monastery of St. John the Theologian on Rhodes in the year 1174. Now, not only does the handwriting in all four manuscripts match that of the overtext of Codex Echinthius, but in the Codex Echinthius lectionary, which normally follows the light of Constantinople, there are two feasts to which unexpected prominence is given, the Feast of St. John the Theologian and the Feast of St. Nalos. So we can now situate the palimpsesting of the Catena manuscript and the production of this lectionary on the island of Rhodes in the 1170s or the 1180s by this scribe, Nalos. What's more, the 56 notes written by this scribe as he was copying give us some insight into his context. Some are markers of conventionality, such as glory to you, Lord, for all things, or Lord have mercy. One, next to the parable of the sower, reads, bring the harvest today, farmers. Others are more personal, with 14 of them mentioning the name Nalos. Five times he urges priests to remember Nalos during the all-night vigil, while elsewhere he says, Lord, save me, the all-hopeness Nalos, panasotom. Nalos is truly a slave to sin, or woe to you, worthless and evil Nalos. On folio 77 lecto, he comments on his copying practice. You can see above this note, there is a long erasure. And underneath he writes, very drowsy and foolish. Bottom of another page where there are many errors which have been corrected by the first hand, he makes the observation that laziness leads to a lack of attention. Most entertaining perhaps is the comment on folio 63, where he says, I am very tired with a heavy head and what I write, I do not know. Modern readers may be shocked to find a scribe, possibly an abbot, adding annotations such as these while copying a book for use in Christian worship. But they still have served their function in keeping alive the memory of this copyist over 800 years later. And they remind us that every chapter of this document has its own importance in its history. Well, there is much more that I could say about Codex Echinthius, but perhaps at this point, on a Friday night sitting in front of a screen, some of us, like Nalos, are very tired and have a heavy head. So I will conclude by hoping that this presentation has encouraged you to explore this manuscript further. Please do visit the electronic edition ball in the Cambridge Digital Library, where it joins our edition of the Bilingual Codex Bizai. You can also download or buy the printed edition and volume of studies by the project, and they provide far more information than has been possible in this lecture. Both of them have been published in open access, thanks to the generosity of the funding bodies. And Gorgias Press has specially put them online this week in time for this conference. Pandemic permitting, there will also be an exhibition of palimpsest manuscripts at Cambridge University Library opening in November, entitled Ghost Words, Reading the Past.
and that will be worth a visit and an opportunity to see Codex Acinthius in person. For now though, thank you again for asking me to honour the memory of Graham Stanton by giving this lecture tonight. Thank you very much indeed, Hugh, for a spectacular lecture and wonderful use, of course, of uh, a, a, a technology to uh, show this manuscript in such a wide variety of uh, uh, fascinating angles. Can I um, encourage people to send in their questions to Kelsey, or they'll be passed to uh, uh, me. We have around about 20 minutes for uh, a discussion. Um, and there are one or two questions in already, uh, so I would like to ask uh, Michael Dormandy to uh, uh, begin this uh, question and answer session. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Absolutely amazing to see all that. And, and thank you for all your team's work restoring this, this wonderful uh, treasure. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just throw, say this before I ask my question. I, I would love to see some of this technology used on Codex eframe at some point in the reasonably near future, but that's perhaps another story. Um, can you say any more about possible links between Zacynthius and Vaticanus? It strikes me as really interesting that the Vatican paragraphs are used, um, and especially thinking of the kind of Martini view that there, there is this sort of chain going back from Vaticanus to P75. I mean, is Zacynthius the, 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 the next one in this chain of, of very careful copying going back quite early, possibly? I think there are, there are two things to consider there. The first is the presence of the palatextual features. The second is the quality of the text. Um, I don't think I actually specified during my presentation that it seems a number of the Vatican paragraph um, chapter, uh, markers have been added by later hands. Um, I mean, there's one case where the ink has transferred from one page to the other, implying that the um, chapter were added at a later stage, either in the copying or during the use of the manuscript. So I'm not entirely sure that the Vatican paragraph markers are part of the original production. There's no list of sections at the beginning of those, as there is for the Kefalaya. In terms of the biblical text, there are quite a lot of overlaps between um, Codex Zacynthius and um, Codex Vaticanus, but not, not a disproportionate number, particularly not if we consider that they might actually be part of the earliest attainable form of text anyhow. The manuscript which is closest to Codex Acinthius is actually um, Codex L, Codex Regius, which you saw um, in the Nestle apparatus alongside it, which is another 8th century manuscript um, currently in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. So these two 8th century manuscripts are both scholarly productions and are much closer to each other, but they clearly come from a line of texts of high value going back to a much earlier point. Thank you. Uh, well, while uh, questions come in, uh, perhaps I could uh, ask a question myself um, about the relationship between this style of commentary and the older style of, of uh, single authored commentary. How, uh, can you tell us, can you give us something of the wider context in which this takes place, in which people, it seems, maybe they're less likely to write their own commentaries, they're more likely to research older commentaries from a, if you like, a kind of classic period. Um, is, is, is this a sort of total shift from the single authored commentary to the preference for the Katina commentary, or uh, is there just a lot of variety here? This is something we're hoping to establish more clearly as part of the Katina project. Um, because I don't think very much work has been done on it at all as regards the New Testament. There has been a lot more work recently, particularly on Katena and the Psalms. The earliest account we have of these, well, I think we should say first of all that there is a sort of culture of excerpting that starts um, in the fifth century. So you have authors on the Greek side such as Chrysostom, on the Latin side such as Augustine, who attain such prestige in their lifetime that people want digested versions very soon afterwards. And so you get people making compilations of Augustine's comments on the Pauline epistles or whatever within a century. So, so that sort of compilation is going on in the fifth century. Um, but it's the sixth century and Procopius of Gaza and his school who are often said to be the origin 
of Catena commentaries, Procopius particularly says with regard to, I think it's the Pentateuch, it might be some of the other earlier books, that, that he has gone through um, collecting extracts from other writers um, in order to gather them and produce um, what sounds very much like a Catena. Um, that said, it's not Procopius who is responsible for the New Testament works and the names which are attached to the New Testament Catena, such as Titus of Bostra or Peter of Laodicea or um, people who we don't know very much about but probably may have preached um, sermon series on New Testament books which formed the basis for Catena. Um, are, um, th that's the sort of background it comes from. So many Catena are attributed to Chrysostom simply because Chrysostom formed the basis for it. Now, in Old Testament Catenae, um, there is the suggestion that Catenae began as two author Catenae. So um, you had two authors who commented on a particular Old Testament book. So maybe um, Thysostom on one side and Didymus on the other. And then these two author Catenae gradually had other scolia added and you have this sort of multiplicity of voices. Um, but it seems that in the New Testament, there's this multiplicity right from the very beginning. So although Codex Echinthius is very strongly based on Cyril of um, Alexandria, nevertheless, we, we have nine other authors as well, and an earlier collection that had multiple authors as part of it. So actually working out when these were put together, probably from the sixth century onwards, but we don't have any other manuscripts before the ninth century apart, it seems, from Codex Echinthius. So, so looking at the development of this tradition um, is, is, is something that is, remains unclear. What, what we do see in terms of the surviving manuscript is that in the ninth, 10th and 11th centuries, um, there was a great enthusiasm for Catenae and a lot of manuscripts survive. Then there was a hiatus and people went back to producing single author commentaries or single author anthologies. Um, and then Catenae had a sort of resurgence and we see them coming back in the 14th century, um, based purely on the number of surviving manuscripts and assuming that they reflect in some way a proportion of the total number known to survive. Um, but but it, it is a mystery and um, something that, that hasn't really been looked into. And so, I mean, the, the first thing we're doing for the Catena project is to try to produce as full as possible a catalogue of Catena manuscripts, simply in order to have the complete numbers and trace um, the development of the tradition and the um, affiliation of these witnesses before we start trying to pull out the strands of how the different types are related to each other. But I mean, it is fascinating. The, attributions, I mean, not we, we know already that much material is preserved in Catena, which is not preserved elsewhere, but we can't, that people always say you must treat them with, with a great, um, great caution, because the attributions may not be accurate. And even in Codex Cynthius, we see as a copy, presumably relatively early on in its tradition, the attributions are not entirely accurate, but they seem to be sufficiently accurate for the majority of cases where we can cross-check, um, that we can start building up hopefully greater confidence in using Catenae as a way of recovering early Christian exegesis. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Steve Walton. Um, Hugh, thank you for a splendid lecture. Um, I, I found myself wondering whether I was seeing Nomina Sacra at a number of places. And I, I then did a quick look at the Courts Cavastalista, which puts the date of the undertext at 6th century. And given that there's been a bit of movement on dating of manuscripts by the, the, the handwriting style recently, I wondered if your project had, had thought any further about the dating. And I, was I right about Nomina Sacra? Yes, you, you were certainly right. Um, Curtis Akintius does use Nomina Sacra as all Christian manuscripts of, of the, you know, from the second, third centuries all the way through do. Um, there is an interesting feature in the Nomina Sacra of Codex Akintius though, which is we see the standard ones, such as God, Christ, Lord, and so on. Um, but the name Son is not abbreviated for the first nine chapters of Luke. Now, now normally son is one of your standard nomina sacra, but for some reason Codex Acinthius doesn't have it, and then there's a switch at about um, nine, chapter nine, verse 13, I think, and suddenly we have six instances of son being abbreviated with all the other nomina sacra. So um, this is um, another early manuscript which could tell us something about the development of that system. 
Now, in terms of the, um, the Lister, the sixth century date for Codex Echinthius was proposed by Hatch, and I've put Hatch's um, article um, on the bibliography, which is on the handout. Um, unfortunately, I, I mean, David Parker and Neville Birdsall in their JTS article take Hatch apart because he was working on a very small section of the manuscript and looking predominantly at the gospel text. And the size of the hand of the gospel text suggests that it's copied in an, archa in an archaizing style. Um, and assuming the gospel text and the Catena and the outside were copied at the same time, which is clearly the case, it's actually the Catena text which has more to tell us paleographically about the date of the manuscript. There are relatively few Greek magiscule manuscripts, easily datable Greek manus magiscule manuscripts from the 7th and 8th centuries or the 9th century. Um, and now we have the multispectral images of every page of the undertext. We actually have a lot more information to go on for the paleographical dating of this manuscript. And one of the interesting features is that there are several um, decorations on some of the letters. Um, little heart-shaped symbols, round marginal material and so on. And I think these decorations could play an important role in the assessing the paleographical dating of the undertext of Codex Echinthius. Um, but we provide all the information for this in the volume of studies um, on Codex Echinthius. And, and there are plenty. Um, in fact, if you download the PDF of it, um, all the images are in colour. So you can see exactly um, the extracted characters with their decorations on. Um, but this is another piece of work which we're hoping somebody will, will do. I mean, 24 months is really not a long time to achieve all these things in a single project. And as far as paleography was concerned, it's simply been a case of presenting the information which, which confirms, and, and, and David Parker, who, who contributed this chapter, was very clear that it confirms that a date before 700 of this manuscript seems very unlikely indeed. The question is, um, can the manuscript be taken much later or not? Because in so many ways, it's an outlier with the Capitula Parallela, with the Catena and so on. But were people really copying manuscripts like this, 240 folios of them in Magiscule script in the 9th century or 10th century? that would make it quite unusual in the opposite side. So mm. this is something we hope will, will, will now be taken forward, but I can't give you any clearer answer at present. Thank you. I, I've had a message um, in chat from um, Chuck Hill about the connection between the text of Codex Echinthius and Cyril of Alexandria. Um, can I say a little bit about that or are we course, short of time? Of course. We are short of time, but do please say something about that. Oh, right. Um, Cyril of Alexandria is, is clearly the key author in this manuscript. What I've noticed is that um, various of the readings, the early forms of text in Codex Echinthius, um, correspond to quotations in Cyril of Alexandria. So I wonder about an Alexandrian origin um, here. Cyril of Alexandria is quoted in the preface that uh, the letter to Eulogius saying um, you must not entirely exclude the works of heretics because they often say things with which we agree. And grammatically, there's also, I find, stylistic resemblances um, between the preface, the opening of the preface that says the person who reads this book must be aware. Um, I've only found that um, formulation um, in Cyril of Alexandria and in one of the prefaces to one of the books of collected letters of Severus of Antioch. Um, so linguistically, textually, and in terms of the exegesis, there's an awful lot going on that connects Codex Echinthius with Cyril of Alexandria. And again, that's another avenue that could be followed up. Thank you. Um, just a few more minutes left. Um, uh, Jen Strawbridge has a question. Hi, Hugh. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for such a, a marvelous presentation. And I'm, I think it's just amazing how many people have been involved in this project as well um, to, make, to make this possible. Um, this is probably a question from ignorance, and I think it might have been answered by your last two um, kind of just parts of your discussion. But I wonder if you might say anything else about kind of a text being surrounded by its own reception. Um, what, and, and that the reception contains such a range in terms of as you said, orthodox and heterodox voices. Is there any scope that you see for sort of kind of future work about how this might 
be picked up by those who work on reception history or could be used in such studies or could could help us in that in that way well I mean, in terms of the modern reception of Catena, I, I think someone brought my attention to a Catena app um, that you can actually download on your phone and will have a selection of different types of exegesis of scripture in a modern sense so so the Catena concept um, is still very much alive uh, what I think is interesting is if Codex Zacynthius does go back to an early stage and we have this desire to include homophony right from the very beginning. Um, uh, as I think I was saying to Francis, uh, the, the collection of lots of different voices rather than a particular, uh, 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 rather than a single author commentary or two authors, actually you have lots of variation and these variations are not necessarily all from authors um, whom any particular church group would want to um, accept all of them, then yes, you, you, you get that same principle of diversity going back to the fourfold gospel. Um, and that's rather a nice continuity going all the way through. So there's certainly something to pick up on there. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip Alexander has a question. Uh, thank you, Hugh, for a, a wonderful lecture again. Um, can I just pick up on the point that Francis raised? about the move from single voice or single author commentaries to, you know, polyphonic commentaries which are combining. I think I'm right that in the Greek medical schools, as well as in the Scolia to Homer, you do get these uh, sort of Catena-like commentaries um, before, before this did. And of course, for someone like myself interested in rabbinic texts, the classic form of rabbinic Bible commentary is polyphonic. It's a kind of katena, a kind of katena. Um, but I think it's a very, very interesting question about the kind of difference between the polyphonic commentary represented by the katena and the single voice commentary represented by the single author commentary. Just a comment rather than a question. Yes, but, but I'd like to pick up on that because the question of the mise en page is an interesting one that was, it, it, if this um, layout with the commentary in the margins is the earliest form of layout, um, what does that tell us something about the development of this type of commentary? Were, was it lots of individuals? Because when I've looked at the Homeric manuscripts, there have been lots of individual scolia added in the margins. And were these original marginal comments which expanded and got bigger and bigger until they ended up encasing the text? Because, of course, yeah. you have the comparison with um, Judaic manuscripts in, the, in that way. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I'm not really sure, but I mean, that layout of the frame Catena, mm. of course, is so uh, well, um, people working in rabbinic texts are so well used, but they're medieval manuscripts, the ones that, uh, that we are thinking of with that frame mm. around, the, uh, around the text. But where that came from in the, in the Jewish tradition has been much debated by um, uh, Hebrew paleographers and codicologists. And it's possible that it, it does go back to uh, Christian Catani layouts. They, they may be the inspiration for that. Um, I just don't, I just don't know. I mean, and I wonder whether if the Copias did have a significant impact and that he was doing it on books of the Septuagint, um, whether there was any sort of tradition there that inspired him. But again, this is a question which still there a way to answer. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Gary Allen has a question. Hi, Hugh. Thank you very much. I won't put my camera on because I'm wearing my daughter's pink headphones. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, overview. Your comment on the, um, uh, you know, it was passed on by Orthodox fathers and disreputable exegetes. This also occurs in a string of extracts in Codex Montfortianus after the Gospels, which is not a Catena manuscript. And so it got me thinking about how much um, explicit discussion there is in preface literature about Catena traditions. What have you seen? There's this small preface that you have in Zacynthius, but how does this uh, relate to the larger sort of uh, tradition of prefacing uh, Gospel manuscripts more broadly? Well, I mean, for uh, uh, an approach to that, we're eagerly awaiting 
the publications from the Palatex Bib project in Munich because their focus is on um, prefaces as well as um, Palatex in the margins. Um, and so at the minute we can only go back to von Soden and see what von Soden collected. The preface to Codex Echintheus is very strange because it occurs in a lot of Catena manuscripts. So we don't find any other witnesses to this Catena, but we do find the preface reoccurring before Ma, before Matthew, before John, and as you say, out of, out of context in Codex Monfortianus. I think I've seen um, Mai suggests that um, it occurs before some um, Old Testament Catena as well. And also these Catena don't have the numbering system that it talks about. So how yeah. can, if, if this preface is originally from the Zakynthian tradition, and, and the point I make is that it's very well suited to Zakynthius, whereas it's not well suited to the others. How do we get this short preface, um, which is very widespread, if it comes from a Catena which doesn't seem to have any other descendants? So, I mean, I hope that the Palatex Bib project will provide us with, with additions and insights um, into the prefaces from the work they've done. But certainly, um, this is a question to be followed up. Yeah, it's a shame they're not doing anything on Catena manuscripts, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Perhaps time for one last question from uh, Matt Novenson. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hugh. It was a wonderful lecture and a Herculean project. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, my question was just about, uh, it's, it's an ignorant one perhaps, but about the relation between the dating of the manuscripts uh, and the question of the the uh, the heretic status of some of the exegetes cited, right? I mean, uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, well, I mean, this is, um, if, if Justinian and the Second Council of Constantinople in the mid sixth century of the anathemas against origin, the anathemas against Severus have come out, what, how does that factor into the transmission of their uh, commentary in Catina form? Right? Is is there an is there an impetus to, to sort of weed out the transmission of their writings in that in that form as well? Well, th this was actually one of the planks in Hatch's dating argument because Hatch said if it contains Severus, it must date from the period between five eighteen and five three six because nobody would dare put Severus into a container after five three six. Um, but a, an alternative approach is in an article um, by Jonathan Moss. Um, which is on the bibliography I've given you. And Moss, um, I, I'm not entirely convinced, but Moss's suggestion is that um, people who adhered to Severus's camp used Catenae to sneak in large extracts from his works and gave you all these very detailed information about which works came from as a way of preserving Severus within Catenae on the grounds that nobody was looking. And this is how Severus could be, um, could, could be kept um, and handed on. I, I think that's slightly implausible because it's done in a very barefaced way. There's no doubt that Codex Achintheus contains Severus. And what's more, Severus in places is called a saint. So I think simply because somebody has an anathema placed on them doesn't necessarily mean that their works are going, um, you know, people are going to be too scared to put their works into Catena. I, the question here is uh, how polyphonic are Catena? How many different traditions are there? Are there mainstream ones? Or you know, could this be a Severan Catena with Severus and um, Cyril of Alexandria and so on? And, and so be following in those sort of Nestorian lines. Um, but um, as textual scholars, that's not something we've yet broached, but, but it is interesting. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Hugh. Thank you to you for those who have uh, asked questions. Uh, Hugh, that was a really wonderful uh, performance, uh, giving us so much insight into things you know an enormous amount about, and which many of us know very little about. It's been absolutely tremendous. Uh, so uh, we would normally, of course, be applauding uh, in these uh, circumstances. Uh, I suggest that we do the next best thing. If you look at your Zoom functions, you may already have found the chat function. If you move three along to the right, you will find reactions and there is the option to applaud or to stick your, your thumb up uh, there. So I suggest that we uh, do that as a token of our thanks to Hugh for this wonderful presentation. Thank you again, Hugh. Thank you.